Hi, everyone. Uh, as you can see, I'm Miroslav Řezník, if you don't know me. I'm uh, working in Red Hat for the product security compliance and risk team. That's like uh, our way how to try to, you know, concentrate everyone who's doing anything with compliance and especially related to security to one bigger team so we can, you know, talk, cooperate and so on. So, and uh, what I do, I cover the government certifications. So I will explain you what government certifications are about, but I will also talk a little bit about the commercial certifications and other, other stuff. You can see I call this, you know, talk from security to compliance and back. I will explain why. Because one thing is like, you know, I, I will try to answer is if compliance really, you know, leads to a better security. And if you have this, you know, security and you are compliant, if you are good or not. So I will try to answer this question and you will see later. Uh, I had a very similar talk, I think like two weeks ago. And uh, after the talk, I was told that it's a pretty depressive topic. So if you have sugar, Snickers, whatever, you know, just, you know, pump some sugar into your brain because, you know, it might be you no know, depressive thing. And that's my life. So I'm trying to hide all my gray hair under the cap because compliance is not easy. And you will see it's not easy. Yeah. So what we will talk about is the first thing is now I will try to explain you what compliance is and not only what it is, but why we are doing it because it's important. Uh, Thing to answer. We will talk a little bit about commercial certifications, uh, more about the government certifications because it's where I live and then we can stay here for, I was told this is the last talk today so we can stay here by, I don't know, 10 a.m., sorry, 10, 10 p.m. and we can, we will have enough, you know, to talk about. Uh, then uh, we are in the EU so there are, there is some, you know, new regulation coming in the European Union so I will touch that thing too. And especially this is a developers conference, so I expect people are more like this, you know, looking into you know, the practice, how to do things over, you know, the theory. So I will try to give you some, you know, like overview. Okay, more people are coming. Welcome. So I will try to give you more like, you know, these, you know, hints and tips, what to do, how to do things. Like, uh, I think I do this for like eight years now. So I believe I have a pretty, you know, good understanding what needs to be done. And then at the end, I will try to answer this, you know, question. Does compliance lead to better security or not? That's the question. Okay, so first, why we do some compliance, why we do try to comply to some standard. It's in the word. We need to comply to some standard. There are you know, like different ways how you can look into this is like you might be you no know, forced by your customers because customers wants to see the stamps you have and if you have more stamps then it's kind of like the you know competitive advantage over your competition because you have you know more stamps. There might be legal reasons, especially you know like recently you can see there is a lot of like supply chain attacks, uh, vulnerabilities hacks, whatever, you know, data breaches. Uh, the regulation is getting stricter and stricter, not only in Europe, not only in US, everywhere. So there are these, you know, the executive orders by White House for supply chains attacks. And so compliance is becoming not only like the nice to have, you know, to be able to compete with your competition, but it's basically like the legal requirement. In the past, it was okay to waive, waive it like, Hey, do you have FIPS? Uh, you know, we don't have FIPS yet, so okay, we want your product to use. We will, we will you know, wave it. Now, it's impossible almost because everyone, you know, cares about compliance and everyone will check that you comply to the standards that are required for procurement and you will even not get to the list like the, what's, for example, the government list. This is the software you can buy. If you don't have, you know, right, you know, standards, right certi certificates, you will not even get to the list. And the customers, the, especially the government customers, will never ever, you know, like consider that they can, you know, buy anything from you. So it's important. And of course, you know, as I said, more stamps is like, you know, having more Pokemons. Like once, you know, received an email from some, you know, like product manager and he was like, he said like, please, you know, do it like a, 
playing a Pokemon, like give us you know as many stamps as possible. So yes, I'm trying you know to collect Pokemons. It's, these are my Pokemons. Okay, so then you have like this you know different certifications. You can take a look on certifications from different angles. One, how you can you know, split it are these you no know, commercial certifications. I will talk a little bit more about these, like the ISO 2700, SOC, PC, IDSS, and other things. Then you have this, you know, government security certifications. So we will talk about common criteria. We will talk about FIPS. Uh, we will touch briefly FedRAMP. Then, of course, it's not only about you know security, but you have the other compliance work. Again, we will show something like VPAD, USGB6, maybe more. Then, of course, you can take a look on this from not only this, you know, like commercial versus government certifications, but also like a service or process certifications compared to product certifications where you certify a product. Sometimes it's, you know, com kind of like combined. I will tell you more about this at, you know, FedRAMP because for to have FedRAMP, you need to have FIPS. So even a FedRAMP is more like this service oriented certifications or even not certifications like audit then you need to have this product certifications underlying that deployment. So this is for different certifications. And yeah, the talk is, uh, subtitle was you know, global overview. As I said, compliance is now required everywhere. So these are just you know, few countries. I would probably be able to fill in this map with all different you know, acronyms. So. For example, in the US or North America, it's usually like FIPS, CC, FedRAMP, uh, in Australia, there's IREP and other regulations. In EU, we will talk more about this with the EU CC, the Cyber Security Act, Cyber Resilience Act. Uh, I could probably also put, let's like, say, Asia, with you know, South Korea, I know they, they do CC a lot. And everywhere, so the map will getting, you know, fuller and fuller over time. And it's becoming, and of course, you can imagine that if you know EU is going to do something different to US, do you have to do both? Yes, you probably have to do both. Then you know Asia, hey, we have our own standard. You know, you have to do it too. And that's very common that you know these standards conflicts in you know many ways. So it's going to be interesting, and it's becoming worse than ever. So let's you know. So let's quickly tap in, touch you know, this, you know, commercial certification. Um, not, you know, expert in these, you know, commercial certifications, but one of the, you know, biggest things uh, recently is the ISO 2700 family. So there are, you know, uh, several standards, the 2701, 2717, 2718. So it's basically an international standard to manage information security. It's the original 2701. And uh, for the 17 and 18, it actually adds something more to this. So it's more about you know the cloud service providers, and the 18 adds the privacy and the data privacy uh, to management to the cloud. So it's pretty common almost everywhere. Even you know here in Czech Republic, there are several companies who can you know do the ISO 2700 for you. So this is one of the, you know, the big commercial, and it's not a product certification, it's more like, you know, this, you know, service slash process certification. Then the SOC, the Service Organization Control, so this is uh, the voluntary one, again, more commercial by the American Institute of Certified Public Account Accountants, and they are like the five areas this, you know, SOC is looking into, so security, availability, Processing integrity, confidentiality, and privacy. So these are like the five, you know, major, you know, uh, areas with more details. Uh, as I said, I'm not, you know, the commercial guy. So if you would, you know, like to know more about, you know, these certifications, please, you know, reach out to me, and I can, you know, connect you to the right people who has, you know, more understanding of this, you know, kind of, you know, certifications. But I will move to. <laughs> My realm, so you can see I'm now smiling because it's uh, what I know. And as I said, I can talk about this for like weeks and uh, it will not be enough because it's pretty, you know, difficult topic. So I will start uh, with common criteria. 
I really like this one because it's called common. It should be like, as I, you know, there was this, you know, global map. It's like, yeah, we have a common criteria certification, so that means it's going to be common. No, it's not common at all. US is doing something, Europe is doing something, different requirements, uh, the mutual recognition, there are, you know, some issues uh, and so on. So basically, common criteria should be that international standard, the big one, as a framework for the computer security certifications. We are already you now facing some like a division in this you know, common criteria thing, so I personally call common criteria like, like a split criteria, because one thing where the split is, there are so-called two ways of you know, how to do the certifications. One is the EAL, the Evaluated Assurance Level, kind of like with the sec with the custom security target, and there's also so-called protection profile based common criteria evaluation. What does it mean? As you can see, I will try to, is this thing, these are these, you know, SFRs and SF, ARs, the security functional requirements. So basically for this, you know, evaluated assurance level, you take these, you know, functional requirements, it's like, you know, uh, these, you know, ciphers are used, uh, TLS is used in this, you know, way, uh, secure boot exists uh, and is tested for secure boot, uh, whatever. So these are the SFRs. Uh, these SARs are assurance that, for example, you follow the processes that nobody can, you know, go with your badge, you know, get into your building, swipe it, get in into the building, do some coding, commit it, then you release it. So basically, the, the EAL is like this custom security target where you, you know, try to pick from a big database of these, you know, SFRs and try to do something that's meaningful based like on the, let's say, uh, thread model, some, you know, like uh, assumptions, you know, how, you know, this, you know, could be, you know, affected and so on. So and you build your own EAL certificate, security target. I will talk, I will show you a security target later. But protection profile, way is doing it different way. It's basically like a template from these SFRs, for example, for operating systems, and there is like a big list of these, you know, SFRs with, you know, actual testing how these, you know, should be tested, and uh, you have to follow it strictly. That means in this EAL, if, if you realize you don't make one of, you know, these SFRs, if it's not something that would probably, you know, make that government angry, you just, you know, Remove it. We don't care about it. It's, it's probably not you know, that secure. So just you know, remove it. With protection profile, you need to make it you know, like 100% pass of what's in the protection profile and what needs to be tested. Basically, what you can do, for example, we do certifications with NIAP. So it's in USA. NIAP only recognizes the protection profile certifications. So if there is, for example, for operating system, there is a protection profile. But for some like other, you know, let's say you have containers, there is no containers protection profile. So the only option is, you know, to go to Europe and Europe, in Europe, we still do EAL. Or other option is like, where is even like the virtualization protection profile? But if you don't fulfill it, you go to Europe and Europe is going to be okay. Yes, don't worry, we can, you know, get you a stamp even you don't have everything from the protection profile. Then there are, you know, two main documents, or the main document is security target that actually, you know, lists how your product, you know, fulfills these requirements. I will show you later how this looks like. And then important thing is this, you know, target of evaluation. It's basically, you can't certify everything. You need to, you know, make that, you know, target of evaluations as small as possible because then it's easier to pass the evaluation. For example, the nice example is like there. One friend, you know, told me about one of the, you know, CC certification where it's about, you know, the webcam, some kind of like that remote webcam. And the target of evaluation is like, yes, the webcam is part of the target of evaluation, but it can't be connected to internet. <laughs> That's, you know, it's easier, you know, to certify something that's not an internet, connected on internet, but if it's a webcam, uh, is it useful? I don't think so. So basically what do you do, you know, what do you know this testing? Uh, there is a lot of documentation that has to be written, and uh, basically this is, you know, how common criteria works. 
if you want to do common criteria, first what you need is you are the vendor. You need to hire an accredited lab. That's some you know, company that's accredited by the government that they can you know, do the testing. And then after they you know, finish testing, write the documentation, they send it to the certification authority. Uh, from this, you know, like labs, what you can, you know, we can hire AdSec, you can hire Intertech, Acumen, Lightship, these are all labs we work with in the summer. Then you have different, you know, national schemes. So that means NIAP, BSI in Germany. I have a nice story about this one later, Oxys in Italy. And there is this, you know, plan to make this obsolete to some extent and have just like one big European scheme. If it will happen, I don't know. Then, you know, another funny thing I told you about, I call this, you know, certification split criteria. There is some kind of like the common criteria recognition agreement. So you can see these are the certificate authorizing, authorizing, authorizing members and the certificates consuming members. These, these countries, you know, try to recognize these, you know, certificates uh, so you don't have to do it in every single country. Of course, there are buts. Different countries have different requirements on what is, uh, what requirements they have. And also this CCRA is now very limited. I told you about this EAL, so EAL has seven levels. But now you can do, for example, EAL4 plus, you know, floor remediation. And you want it recognized by other country? No, it won't be recognized because the EAL4 will be, for example, recognized in Germany. But in any other country, it will be recognized up to EAL level two. So it basically doesn't matter if you do, you know, this higher, you know, assurance level, because it's not going to be recognized internationally. And trust me, you don't want to do anything that's above EAL2, because so EAL4 means someone will come, you know, to your side, and they'll be do this, you know, this, you know, audit, like I told you about the badges. Then they hear, okay, so you have another office? Yeah, we want to visit that, you know, another office. Yeah, in another office. Yeah, you have servers in, Another server room, yeah, we want to see that, you know, physical server you ship your software from. So then you can have like, you know, I don't know, five side visits everywhere, especially for companies like Red Hat. We are a global company, we have offices everywhere. And, oh, and then they realize, okay, you have remote people, they are working from home. It's like, no, you can, you know, visit anyone at home because, well, it's impossible. So this happens. And uh, I can show you how these, you know, where you can find more information. So let's try this way. Yeah, so there is this, you know, common criteria, portal.org. It's the standard, you know, government kind of, a, you know, website. It should be redesigned soon. And basically, if you are interested in, you know, certified products, you just, you know, go to the common criteria portal and you can see it's, you know, uh, split into categories. So, for example, let's go to operating systems, and you will see that they are, you know, different operating systems uh, certified. But for us, we do this, you know, NIAP. I told you, you need to be on some, you know, list. For NIAP, for US, it's called product compliant list. If you are not on this list, you have bad luck. So make sure you, you will get there. And basically this is the same, same one just for, just for US. You can see, for example, RHEL 8.2. If you click on it, you will see the certificate, the security target, that's the document I told you about. Uh, interesting document is this, you know, administrative guide that actually explains how you should configure your product to be in the you know evaluated configuration so it's a target of evaluation again everyone you know tries to limit this to that smallest footprint and do some you know additional hardening and so on so this is how cc looks like and let's let's continue now yeah i can see a lot of you know fips people in this room so there is another standard it's called fips 140-2, now it's 140-3. So it's a Federal Information Processing Standard Publication uh, 140. Uh, now we have this, you know, 140-3 version. It's uh, pretty, you know, recent. Uh, 
formal, it's the North American standard, but it has now the ISO, so they try to, you know, make it ISO standard. Trust me, it was so difficult to get this, you know, ISO standard, the PDF copy. It took us, you know, several months to get a copy. It was probably better when it wasn't standard at all. Uh, and this is all about the validation of cryptography. So basically, you validate these called, you know, cryptographic modules through this, you know, modules validations, validation program. It's under NIST. It's like a uh, U.S. Meteorology Institute kind of thing. I was at one talk, and they told me, or actually, in the talk, that person said, "Hey, we are NIST. We know how to measure steel. We are the guys who measure steels." And then someone, you know, came to us and told us, "Hey, you need to, you know, measure software." So they are like fighting within this, you know, what they should do and how do they should do things. And basically, what you certify is not like a product as well, but you'd certify that, you know, cryptographical, you know, primitives or cipher suits that are in that, in that, uh, for example, library or some hardware module like YubiKey, whatever it is. I will jump to this. One of the, you know, that things that FIPS is slow. It's challenging if you go because of, you know, many requirements. Uh, it could be, you know, difficult on both engineering side and financial side, so it's definitely not cheap from the, you know, like investment perspective. Uh, just, you know, to give you how slow FIPS 140-3 is. So, in the past, I think, like, it's, it's mid-June, so in this you know, almost six months, NIST was able to issue only one FIPS 100-3 certificate and they have another like 146 in the queue. So basically I believe I will retire before you know, we will receive all certificates we need. So that's one of you know, the challenges there. Then there is a document called security policy that basically you know, explains you know, how you should use that module in the compliant way. That means you know, what you know, API you need to use, what uh, algorithms are actually you know, approved and they're, they're tested. And uh, at, in Red Hat, we validate five cryptographic modules. That means OpenSSL, NSS, Kernel Crypto API, GNU TLS, and LibGCrypt. And we try to revalidate often. We tried in the past to do it with every minor release. But then I told you, like, it could, be, it, it could take, you know, one year to receive a certificate. And then the life cycle of the minor release is six months. It, you know, it doesn't make much sense, you know, to spend money on, on that. And I will tell you more about how slow this thing is, but I have a special offering for you. So if you want, you know, fast FIPS certificate, talk to me, and I can give you a certificate within a few weeks. I can. And now let's jump to something like that builds on top of it. You can see that we are adding, adding things. Where is like this big, big thing for basic any you know cloud deployment or cloud service in the U.S. FedRAMP. FedRAMP is the must that U.S. government will not talk to you and will not you know buy your cloud service without having FedRAMP. It's the Federal Risk and Authorization Management Program. So it's a U.S. government program to uh, comply that you know that there is this you know, standardized approach to security. Assessment, authorizations, continuous monitoring is a big, big part of that, of cloud products and services. That's basically it. FedRAMP, there are several levels. You can have it, you know, tailored. You can have FedRAMP medium and FedRAMP high. Basically, my understanding is if you don't have high, it's you know, useless to some extent because everyone wants the highest security. It's always, you know, nice, you know, to have the highest third. Then, you know, there is this, you know, two ways how to do it. One is like this, you know, agency ATO. That means you will, you know, find some, you know, U.S. government agency, and they will be, you know, willing to go through this process with you. Basically, in the end, they, it's going to be approved to, for use in this agency. And if you would like, you know, to use this, you know, or some other, you know, U.S. government agency would like to use your product, they would need to do your, 
do own assessment on top of you know what you know this other agency did for you. Then you have this you know another JEP route, this joint joint authorization board. If this you know JEP approves your you know FedRAMP, then e any agency can use it. So it's basically way you know better you know to go, go for this you know JEP, but it's you know more difficult. It takes more time and. Uh, so usually, you know, what, what people do, they start with some agency, they try to, you know, to get the process running, uh, get ready, get the agency authorization, and then they go for, for this, you know, jab. Uh, instead of lab, these, you know, companies who do it for you are called 3PAO. It sounds like from Star Wars. It's not C3PAO, but for whatever reason, they liked it. And this is that important part as I said, we are building things on top of each other. FIPS is the requirement. It kind of like makes sense. Like we have a standard for cryptography in US government, so we should you know, use it instead of like, you know, forcing you to do something else that might be again in conflict you know, with you know, what you do. Oh, I will just you know, quickly scan through this. You know, other certifications, one is the VPAD, it's for accessibility. Uh, mandated for this, you know, Section 508 Rehabilitation Act in the U.S. There is international version, and it's based on WCAG 2.0 standard. Then another thing is like USG v6. It's the testing that your network device or OS, whatever it is, is compliant to IPv6. I believe actually, you know, Czech government also, you know, like ask for IPv6 support, but nobody tests it in the U.S. Yes, they do. They, you need a stamp. Yes, this my product you know, works in IPv6. And now I talked to the lab and they told me, hey, we have actually a new test. Now th there is a testing like it, it works for real in IPv6 only network. So it's going to be fun. <laughs> and yeah, what to expect in you? Yeah, I have a question. Who likes open source in this room? Not that many hands as I expected. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised. I <laughs> I'm leaving. <laughs> yeah. So what's going to happen in Europe? <laughs> no open source, no more. <laughs> Sorry. So this is, you know, like just you know, some you know newspaper, you know, titles I you know, was able to get from like last two months. This is the Python Foundation warns EU the Cyber Resilience Act will, you know, sync open source. Yeah. So what's going on in Europe? There are two things. The main, main thing is like the EU Cybersecurity Act. Under this, this act, this you know, EU CC, that should be the you know, one standardized uh, scheme for common criteria in Europe. The EU CS is for cloud services. So basically, EU is building own common criteria based schemes. The EU CC is almost approved. The EU CS, it's not yet approved. There was this you know, private. Uh, draft it leaked, and after it leaked, so it caused you know like a lo lot of you know fuss in the cloud service providers community. So we will see how this will work. But this you know EU Cyber Resilience Act, I really like this subtitle: "The Road to Hell is Paved with Good Intentions." It actually makes perfect sense, you know, that what we use in Europe, whatever it is, hardware, network, hardware, device, whatever it is, software is resilient to cybersecurity attacks. But the main problem here is like it puts you know, too much liability on especially you know, open source projects and how it could you know, threaten open source project is that there is extension for non-commercial activities. That they, you can say yes, open source it's non-commercial, but even like any you know, these you know, foundations like Python Software Foundation, they always, you know, need to get some, some money. So the question is like, is it, you know, extent or not? So for example, it, uh, Python Software Foundation, they say that they might, you know, turn off the PyPy repositories in Europe because they can't be accountable for, you know, what's in these repositories. They can't be, you know, fined. I even, you know, at some, you know, point, at some conference, I seen that if you don't like your CEO, make, you know, big, you know, security, you know, breach in your product, and he will, you know, go to jail. That's one of, you know, the proposals. Well, you'll see, you know. So Europe, it's going to be interesting if read about it, 
if you are open source enthusiast, you know, talk to your you know MEPs, your favorite MEPs, and explain them that this can't you know pass in this way because it would threaten open source. Yeah, so we are slightly over time now, so I will you know quickly you know show you this you know this is that you know, timeline, and we are last talk so. So this is you know how long it can it can take. You can see that you know it could be like a year, two years, three years. So basically like all the work that you need to do. One interesting thing about NIAB is like they are super strict. You need to finish within 180 days. If you don't finish within 180 days, you fail uh, certification. Okay. So yeah. Just you know one last slide before we will go to, to QA is these are the tips I promised you. One thing is like, get ready, be prepared, but expect unexpectable. At any time, some you know, change in the standard can come. They are pretty frequent standard changes. The standards are strict, but often very subjective to who reads it. So one person can read it in a way, another way. So there's you know, one big thing, and of course, vulnerabilities. All these standards hate vulnerabilities in the process. For example, for CC and NIAP CC, there is a rule that there can be any known vulnerability at the time the product receives certificate. This is impossible. Like there is always, you know, some vulnerability somewhere. So yes, and in, and in the window of 30 days, it's almost impossible to make it. Uh, maybe one last tip, and I like this one: be honest with your lab, with the government. It's usually you know, nice, so one of the replies I got recently when I explained to one of the governor, government guy, something, he was like, instead many vendors are acting like embarrassed teenagers trying to pretend they don't have acne but not to by not talking about it. So be transparent, but also be careful because you don't want to know sometimes disclose too much. And yeah. Yeah, so for the answer, does compliance lead to better security? That's no clear answer. It you know, gives you a better culture. It adds complexity. So it could you know, actually cause additional issues. And if you have time, I will show you this you know, research by the Masaryk University. I can see one guy from the Masaryk University here, and we can talk about it later. So are certifications useful? Yes. Should you have it? Yes, but you know, be careful. It can you know take time, and it can be expensive. So that's all I have. Any questions? Okay. So the question is like for Europe: Is it going to be the process based or more checklist based? It's Europe, so I expect it's going to be more on the you know, process side because Europe really likes processes. So, yeah, US version is more like this, you know, checklist. Like, you need to test this, 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 this. If you pass, you are go okay. In Europe, they will, you know, more be interested in going through this, you know, checklist. Uh, usually for every, you know, certification, you need to have some periodic recertification. But the validity of certificates could be for like, like for example, NIAP is two years, uh, FIPS is five years, BSI is five years, so it depends country by country. Okay. Any other question? I have one. Uh, if customers uh, require the training criteria certification, do they then use the configuration described in the security target or not? Okay, so the question is if customers, you know, requires the common criteria certification and if they will use that, you know, how it's, you know, describe how they should use that product. It depends. <laughs> there are customers who care only about, or maybe not customers, like people who care about the stamp. So if it has the stamp, they can, you know, you can sell to the government and government might be okay with just that stamp. There are customers who will read you know, that maybe security target, uh, security policy, letter by letter, and if something is not what they like, they will tell you, no, it's not enough for us. Especially this, you know, question is when, you know, for example, you have this, you know, certificate on version that has CVEs. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
I have to respond to them that they should use that you know certified version. If you know that remark, but you should be secure. So <laughs> there, there is, yeah, I can I can answer you because it really depends. Yeah, you have to recertify, but again, it takes several months. There will be another CVEs. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. So I can see no more questions. So yeah, thank you for listening.